This happened a few years back in 2005, when I was around 10, just about to turn 11. That would have made my sister 14. We come from a pretty small town in the UK, where not much of interest usually happens, and our main attraction is the local shopping center or mall. My parents would often give us pocket money, and let us take the bus into town to go to the cinema, located inside the shopping center on weekends. Being a video game obsessed little nerd, it was my ritual at the time to save up some of the money and buy discount pre-owned games from the game station store in the mall. There was something about the build-up of anticipation, reading those little booklets they used to have in game cases on the bus on the way back. I would be off in my own little world, reeling off facts about the game I had learned from gaming magazines to my poor sister, who'd just smile and nod humoring me until we got home and she could escape for a breather. I would lock myself in my room for a weekend of full-on, non-stop gaming. A few months prior to this particular trip, my gran had moved from her old council house in a run-down part of town, which was scheduled for demolition, to a new one much closer to her family home. Between our two neighborhoods ran a main road with a bus stop, near an underpass where we used to get off the bus on our way back from the shopping center. We then used the underpass to cross the road, which was surrounded by wooded areas on both sides, before walking the remaining 10 or 15 minutes from the bus stop to our house. We lived in the kind of suburban zone where buses stopped only at the entrance to the estate, and never actually ventured into the streets where the houses stood. Gran's house was the closest of the two to the bus stop, on this day, I follow my sister off the bus, distracted by the stack of games in my hands, my head in the clouds looking at the screen grabs and the blurbs on the back of the cases, as usual. I got the vague sense that my sister was a little tense, but I figured she was just in a rush to get back home and hop on MSN Instant Messenger. It's worth pointing out that at this time, we were in the middle of a family feud, and my parents weren't exactly on speaking terms with my gran. It had been a while since we had gone to visit her, and my dad had pretty much banned us from seeing her. My sister decides to forego our usual route via the underpass, and leads me instead toward the side where our gran's house is located, heading the opposite direction of our own. This surprised me, and being an impatient little jerk, I began questioning her insistently as to why she was taking me to Gran's house when I desperately wanted to go back home with my haul. She infuriated me further by giving me vague answers like, it seems like a good day for a walk, and I just want to check how she's doing. Thinking back now, it makes a rock sink deep in my stomach, but I told her dad had forbidden it, and that I was going to walk the other way back to our house by myself and that she could continue on on her own. Of course, being the older, street-savvy sister, she wouldn't let me, claiming our parents would get mad if I showed up alone, and that it was her responsibility to look after me. We kept walking in the direction of Gran's house, and for the first time I started to feel a bit uneasy. I noticed my sister keeps checking over her shoulder and picking up the pace, telling me to hurry up, I start to think it's weird how she keeps very loudly exclaiming how everyone is waiting for us around the corner at Gran's house. Eventually we arrive, and Gran is very surprised to see us. She invites us in, we have some biscuits, and I play with her dog for a while as we wait for our parents to come pick us up. Fast forward about a month or so later, and the incident is more or less forgotten about by me when our town's first and only case of a missing child hits the news. It was on everyone's lips, and I even remember my parents and my friends' parents joining search and rescue parties, scouring through the surrounding woodland. Tragically, the young boy who went missing was found dead in the woods shortly after the first missing persons report was filed. The whole town was rocked. The main suspect in the case committed suicide before the police had a chance to talk to him. We were all shocked by what had happened. 
that the boy had been abducted while walking through an underpass on his way to school. This underpass was maybe four or five stops along from the stop my sister and I alighted at. I was dense and didn't connect the dots until much later, when my sister confessed to me that she had decided to take the detour to Grand's house that day after getting an uneasy feeling from some man sat behind us on the bus. He had followed us off the bus and stalked us before watching us enter Grand's house and disappearing quickly in the opposite direction. Her sharp instincts and quick thinking are probably the only reason I'm still alive to tell this story today. That, and the fact my gran had to move to a council house, which was so miraculously close to our bus stop. Okay, so first of all, I don't want this to seem like a story in search for sympathy but more of a way to finally accept it and move on. Hopefully help other girls or boys realize the red flags in a relationship that I so blindly overlooked. I'm sorry if this is a little long, but please bear with me, as it's worth the read. For some background information, I'm 18 years old. I met this boy. We'll call him Trent. Saved me the pain of having to type his name. Trent and I met through a mutual friendship and group of friends that I was very close with for many years. We started hanging out as a group to smoke and sesh with our friends. He was the loveliest boy, with such kind eyes and the most adorable smile. I was completely infatuated. Trent had a past before I knew him. Troubles with past girlfriends, and a bit known for a bad temper but I ignored the warnings from multiple people, and even the ex of his, assuming the classic lie, he'll never hurt me though. We started dating late March last year, the 21st to be exact. He asked me out on a night when he had taken a lot of Xanax for fun with his friends, and was expressing to me and his friends within two months of knowing him, how he was completely head over heels for me. That made me fall deeper and deeper. Everything was so exciting and new, and he gave me butterflies. Side note to this, I have been diagnosed with severe anxiety disorder and bipolar 2 disorder, which just adds to the fun of my life, I guess. All was good until about four months of being together. I was at home one night, planning to push through it and go out for some drinks with him and some friends, but changed my mind as I physically could not leave my bed. That night, he disappeared, his phone off for hours, and me worried sick. In the morning, I wake up to a message saying his phone had gotten broken when he got pushed into the pool and had to leave it to sit in rice overnight. He came over to my house that day and took care of me while I was sick. Two months go by, and I find out three days before my birthday that on that exact night he had cheated on me after he enticed his ex-girlfriend to go over to his house, saying that he was going to take his own life because we had a fight and I wouldn't speak to him anymore. They had sex that night, and when I found out, it broke me. My heart ached and raced, pounded in my chest, and I left his house in tears, with him chasing me up the street after me. I hid in a driveway and turned off my tracking location Find My Friends, that he set up on my phone and caught the first bus that I saw after hiding. I watched him pace around the streets, shirtless and shoeless, while searching for me. An hour later, I decided to answer his call, call number 23 or so, and told him to leave me alone. It was then that he started screaming and crying and begged, but I didn't give in and so ended the call. Two minutes later, he called me again saying he needed to go to the hospital as he shattered his hand while punching a hole in a glass mirror behind his door. After a few weeks of my heart longing for him and him begging for me, I felt like he must have really loved me to do all of this. The stupidest mistake I've ever made. His behavior continued throughout our six-month relationship. If I didn't answer a phone call, I'd receive ten within five minutes, and ten messages of how I was a dog and a bitch. 
even if I had just left my phone in my room for 20 minutes while I had dinner. He demanded to see me all the time, and begged to be by my side every minute. I saw all of this as an expression of his love for me. Our relationship was spent majorly smoking weed, daily, and I mean all day. If he wasn't stoned, all hell would break loose until he could get high again. I spent hundreds of dollars buying marijuana to help him feel better when we'd argue in the car or he'd be in a bad mood. He had made threats to me and my friends in the past about killing all of the dogs. My friends didn't see it in the way I did, and eventually we had falling outs. He assured me they weren't my real friends. He was the only real person I had in my life who truly cared and loved me, and I believed that. My confidence diminished. My happiness was released in the smallest doses. I began to stop recognizing the girl who I was, and couldn't remember how it felt to really feel genuine happiness. Only when he was in a good mood and wanted to be intimate and cuddly, and that's when I felt good. On our six months, we had a lovely dinner in the city at a super expensive restaurant. After our meal and a few drinks, he told me to go wait around the corner for him to pay while I called the cab. I found out when he walked out that he had not paid, and we had made a run for it. Later that night, we went to visit our two best friends who were also a couple, and were our smoking squad, as uh, we like to call ourselves. We decided to go for a little drive, my sober friend was driving, around the corner, and smoke a little before going back home to bed. It was while we were chopping up that me and my girl Bella were whispering in the back. Trent couldn't quite understand what we were talking about, and demanded to know what we were saying. As a joke, Bella sarcastically replied that I was talking about another boy. This is when he ran around to her side of the car. As he did this, I pulled the lock on her door, and he punched a hole straight through her window, leaving shatters of glass flying all over. The police came for a noise complaint, and after coming up with an excuse, I was left to walk my boyfriend home while he was sobbing and apologizing. Eventually, we were escorted home in the police car. We broke up that weekend after encounters of him smashing his head into a wall, swiping a photo frame off the table and slicing his hand, punching a hole in my brother's car windscreen, and grabbing my shirt while I was driving. I had officially been scared and saw for the first time in my life that he might really be dangerous. I told him I couldn't be with him after the damage he did to my brother's car. My family would never look at him the same, and would ban me from seeing him. The very next morning, he made me pick him up at 8 a.m., and he took the car to get the window fixed so I wouldn't leave him. In short words, I didn't forgive him. A week later, a week of hundreds of missed calls, thousands of messages off every single social media possible. He began sending me photos of bottles of Xanax that he was buying, telling me he was going to eat them all and it was going to be my fault. My heart dropped, and I answered his call and begged him to not be so silly. I told him I would go and see him that afternoon to make sure he was okay, but not to get back together. He seemed happy with that, and hung up the phone. That day, I was with a couple girlfriends at a pool party with some of my old friends that he didn't particularly like. After being there for maybe an hour or so, I bet you can guess who just let themselves in and walked straight inside, demanding to everyone that I leave right now. I refused. I was petrified. His eyes. I knew that look. The way his green eyes turned almost black when he was in a rage. I continued to refuse him and told him that I would come outside and talk to him if he let me bring one of the boys outside to make sure I was okay. He didn't like that one bit, and decided to leave. Okay, that was a relief for me. Less than 20 seconds later, we hear smashing in the side street. The whole house ran out to investigate, and watched as Trent ran back to his car and sped off, after ripping off the windscreen wipers of another one of my best friend's cars, and shattering each window. At this point, we were all so worried and angry and confused, we decided that we should drop the damaged car to my house so it was off the streets and somewhere safe. However, my car was parked a few streets over. 
I got into the car and began driving when I was rammed into an intersection. My car was spinning, and I quickly gained control only to realize that he was chasing behind me in his own car. We zoomed through the traffic, through red lights, intersections, squeezing through almost impossible car spaces in a movie-like pursuit. I almost hit three pedestrians and God knows how many cars. He chased me down the streets, continuously ramming against me, then slowing down and speeding up just to ram me again. Glancing back in my rearview mirror, I saw him laughing and taunting me. Those eyes I will never forget. Immediately when I noticed him chasing me, I called Triple Zero, Australia's version of 911, and tried frantically explaining to the operator where I was and what was happening whilst being rammed and trying to dodge cars, people, and sidewalks. I thought I'd throw him off and turn into a car park that was right there, but he was too quick and spit out in front of my car, locking me in while he blocked the exit with his car. The door opened, and he stepped outside, throwing himself at the windows and trying to rip open the doors. I screamed into the phone and begged for help, but they just couldn't seem to find me. Eventually, I decided that the windows were going to give out soon, and I needed to get away. I drove up the gutter, ripping off half of the front bonnet of the car, and sped all the way back up the street. I thought I got away when I saw he was struggling to get back into his car, but that relief was shattered when I saw his white car right behind me again, ramming and stopping, ramming and stopping while he laughed. I drove up through three suburbs and drove straight to my dad's house. I harked the horn like a crazy person, but his car was quick to catch up, and I couldn't bear the thought of putting anyone in my family at risk of this maniac, so I kept going, hoping that he wasn't quick enough to swipe my car off the cliff edge that runs along my street. I continued driving, driving over the top of all the roundabouts, but I didn't care. My mother lives around the corner from my dad's, and I started to head there, but as I reached the street, I remembered my five-year-old sister and my mom, and wouldn't dare put them at risk, so I kept driving. Around corners, swiping into cars and trying to find every main road possible, begging for help to the operator, and for them to please just find me. I continued to fly down the street at 120 kilometers. I'm an 18-year-old girl. I've never driven so fast or chaotically. After about 10 minutes of what seemed like an hour, I reached a yet another main road and repeated my location to the operator, all while being rammed and tormented. He sped up in the lane next to me, in the opposite side of the road, and swerved his car in front of mine in an attempt to lock me in, so he could try again to rip me from my car. My immediate reaction was the reverse. I put the car into R and put the acceleration flat to the floor. It only took seconds for him to get back into his car and begin driving at me, head on. The only thing I could do was drive forwards at him. This was the part where everything went in slow motion. I saw him coming at me. We were driving at each other at about 40 kilometers per hour. And my only options were to either crash into a parked car next to me, crash head on into Trent, or crash into a telephone pole on the other side of the road. The only thing running through my mind was which would be the quickest and least painful way to die. So I chose the pole, and I took a hard right turn as I missed the front of it by being saved by the gutter, saving my life by mere inches. This really made him mad, and he turned the car back around and T-boned the driver's side door, pinning me in. He got out and yet again punched and kicked and slammed at all the windows. Let me tell you, this boy is at least a hundred kilograms, about six foot something. He was massive. I stood no chance. I began to hop from seat to seat trying to stay as far away from whichever window broke first as possible. The whole chase lasted 17 minutes. This is when the sirens began to ring and I broke down and cried as he ran back into his car and took off up the street. He jumped five fences before they managed to tackle him. He spent a weekend in a holding cell and was released on bail. My heart ached. My head spun. My mental illness had reached an all-time low, and without him I was ready to die. The whole situation made me want to die. But for some strange reason, I felt I still loved him. 
It made me sick, but I did. He was handed a restraining order, but that didn't stop him. On the day of his release, he began apologizing, begging, crying, saying he had no memory and that he was sorry and that he'd never do it again. This is the part where you're all going to hate me. I wanted to take him back. I told him I still loved him and I still spoke to him daily. He told me he wouldn't have done those things if I didn't make him so angry, and I apologized sincerely. But the jealousy and protectiveness continued. The more threats. Shouldn't have called the cops and just let me kill you. I'm going to kill everyone close to you. I hope you die tomorrow. I'll laugh. The list goes on, and it took me two more months to wake up and realize what the fuck I was doing after he had bashed a boy that I kissed and started doing drive-bys at places that I'd hang out at just staring at me. The saddest part is, when I asked him if he had broken the windows and gotten into their car, what he would have actually done, he replied that he honestly didn't know. So girls and boys, if you ever feel mistreated, speak up. If you notice red flags, don't ignore them. A leopard never changes his spots. Everything happened last year in May. At that time, I was 15 years old, and I was in the 10th grade at high school. My school has an afternoon program for the 9th and 10th graders. This meant that my classes started at 12 p.m., and sometimes finished at 5 or 6 p.m., rarely at 7. For three days on the 25th, 26th, and 27th of May, I'd been attending a convention, East European Comic Con, which was really far away from home, about on the other side of the city. To get there from home, I had to use the subway, about nine stations, and the bus for about six stations. Because the first day of the convention was on the 25th, a Friday, I went directly from my high school with my best friend Mary and stayed for only about two or three hours. I didn't want to come home late, and I was really exhausted because I had finished class at 5.30 p.m. Also, the roads are really busy on a Friday night. Everything was fine, and I came home really happy because I had lots of fun. The next day, it was the 26th and a Saturday. Usually on the weekends, the subway is ten times more empty, and the roads get busy only in the evening. I met my friend at the bus station in the morning at 9 a.m., and we went together to the convention. There we met our other friends and stayed for about 10 or 11 hours. She had to wait for her mom to pick her up, but my parents insisted that I had to get home using the public transport. They said this because they thought it would be inconvenient for her parents to pick me up, too. Clearly something my parents regret now. Everything was fine during the bus ride. I was listening to music, scrolling through Facebook, and just minding my own business. When I got to the subway, it was extremely empty. I could barely see anyone, and it was around 8 p.m.-ish. Because I had to change the thoroughfare, I needed to walk about five minutes, still in the subway area, to get to the train that leads to the nearest station to my home. As I was waiting for the train, a man starts walking around me. He was in his thirties, and he was looking pretty bad. He had red puffy eyes and dirt all over his hands and face. At first, he just walked past me three times. I felt like he was walking in circles around me. As an instinct, I put my phone in my pocket and took off my headphones and unplugged them. The train arrived in four minutes, but honestly, it felt like an eternity. I sat down and tried not to panic. He sat down right next to me. We were the only ones in the subway wagon. I thought to myself, why would he sit right next to me when there are loads of empty seats? There was an old man that was sitting at the other end of the train. I wanted to get to him so I could feel a little better, a little safe. As I stood up, this dude literally grabbed my hand and pulled me hard, and I fell back on the seat. He started smiling and said, If you don't sit right here next to me, it's going to be bad, girl. 
I almost started crying. I tried to stay calm and react normally. I nodded and he let go of my hand. And this time I had looked at and examined him very well. He was wearing ripped jeans and a t-shirt with holes in it and a jean jacket. He started to ask me questions. How old I am? What's my name? Where am I coming from? What do I have in my bag? He was speaking aggressively, and I didn't know what to do. When he saw that I was not answering, he mumbled something and then started talking about his interests. Norse gods and Norse mythology. I don't know what made him bring up this topic, but I sat there, listening. It's been almost ten minutes, and I felt like I had no way to escape. I heard footsteps, and in that moment, I looked up and realized that the train was almost reaching the second-to-last station. The footsteps were coming from the old man that I saw earlier. He looked at me and said, Where have you been? I've been calling and texting you for hours. Come on, we need to go home. I breathed a sigh of relief. I could hear the dude mumbling something again. Just before the train stopped, he asked me if I'm willing to give him my phone number so we could chat again. I told him that I couldn't and that I really had to go. The old man gave him a dirty look when we got off the train. We started to walk towards the exit, and when we saw that the train left the station, we stopped. The man looked at me and said, Is this your station? Are you okay? Did he hurt you? Is there anything I can do for you? I saw the way he pulled you and heard the way he spoke, and I thought you might need some help. I told the old man that I had exactly one more station and that I was fine, and just a bit scared. He advised me that I should talk with a security guard immediately and tell him what just happened, so I did. I kept thanking the old man for what he had done for me. I took the next train and I texted my dad and told him to pick me up from our subway station immediately. In about three or four minutes, I got off the train. I was at my station. As I was climbing the stairs to reach the exit, I heard someone yelling, You lying whore. I didn't have time to turn around because I was knocked down. I screamed so hard that I started crying and started to sort of move to try and get this man off of me. And because I had talked with that security guard on the other station, thank God. Two other security guards were already waiting to check on me, and they were equipped with a taser. When they heard me screaming, they rushed right over and helped me to get up and put the man down. They told me to call the police and wait for someone to take me home. I told them that my dad was upstairs, outside the underground area. I ran so fast to my dad and told him everything, and he called the police. The man was arrested. The media refused to make this case public because the man was a gypsy, and it would have been racist to shame his ethnicity and show the bad side of this minority. Back when I was a kid, my mom and I had a deal. She'd schedule all of my scarier appointments, like dentist visits and vaccines, in the morning. And if I left without whining or fussing too much, I'd get to play hooky for the rest of the school day and we'd get lunch, go to the mall, and see a movie. This was on one of those days. It was a few weeks before Christmas, but the mall was pretty quiet because it was around 1 o'clock on a weekday. I had just had my picture taken with Santa. We'd done some Christmas shopping and had lunch at my favorite restaurant, and we were going to finish off our day with whatever kid's Christmas movie was playing at the time. I don't remember which one it was, but I remember how fun and pleasant the day had been overall. The theater itself was almost empty. Just my mom and I and a few parents with kids too young to be in school. A few minutes later, a single man walked in. I remember him entering because I thought it was strange that he didn't have any kids with him, and because he seemed to spend a long time surveying the theater, the way people do when they're trying to find a seat or two in a crowded auditorium. I remember him staring at me for quite a while. But then he sat down near the door and I didn't think too much about it. A girl I played with in my neighborhood had really strict parents, and they always went to see kids movies alone first to be sure they approved of them. Maybe his kids went to school with me and he recognized me, and that was why his eyes had lingered. 
Just as the preview started, I realized I needed to go to the bathroom. I had just turned eight a few months prior, and my mom was finally letting me do things like that without her accompanying me. As I got up to go, my mom slipped me $10 and told me to get us some candy and soda, a real treat in my house. I was so excited to be trusted to go by myself and to get candy that I almost didn't notice when the man from earlier got up and followed closely behind me as I left the theater. Almost. As I was allowed to do things by myself more, my parents had drilled into me that I always needed to be aware of my surroundings and anything that felt off. The way he bolted from his seat to follow me out of the theater felt strange. To give a little context, the movie theater was attached to the mall, so the main entrance was through the mall itself. To make getting out a little easier, there were a few exit-only doors that led to the parking lot. The restrooms were right next to these. The man followed me all the way to the woman's bathroom. Not close enough to immediately spook me if I hadn't noticed him, but close enough that any passerby would assume he was a father tailing behind his daughter. After I got to the restroom, I peeked out. He had stationed himself just outside the entrance to the bathroom, on the side closest to the exit. I'd told myself that maybe he needed to use the bathroom too, but clearly that wasn't the case. So I peed, and then I waited, and waited. I heard a man's voice just outside joke with someone about how he was waiting for his daughter who was dawdling. I knew my mom wouldn't get worried and come look for me immediately, because she would assume I was in line to get snacks, but I couldn't get back to her without going past the man. Finally, a nice-looking older woman came in. As she was leaving, I told her I'd forgotten how to get back to my theater where my mom was waiting, and asked if she could walk me there. I held her hand tightly as she cheerfully told me she was glad to help. As we left, the man waiting took a quick step forward, like he'd been waiting the whole time to grab me. When he saw that I was with the woman, he turned around and left out the exit door. I made it back to my mom without incident. I told her I didn't see any candy that I wanted, and I was kind of full from lunch anyway. In hindsight, I should have told her right away about the creepy guy who followed me but I was afraid I'd lose my precious new independence. Looking back as an adult, I still can't figure out any benign intentions that would explain his actions, and I desperately hope that he didn't catch some other little girl unaware. What is up, guys? Blue Spooky here, as always. I uh, just wanted to thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. Uh, I have a little bit of an update here for you guys. I uh, recently started streaming a little bit on Twitch. Uh, I don't know if you guys are interested in just hanging out and seeing a bit of gameplay of maybe Monster Hunter or some games like that, maybe a few horror games, but uh, I'll leave a link to my Twitch in the description of the video below. As always, uh, if you guys like the video, Please leave a comment or perhaps uh, like or subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you'd like to message me or you'd like to send in a story for me to read or you have a suggestion for a story I should read, the links to all of my social media will be in the description of the video below as well. This includes my Facebook, Twitter, Gmail, and now of course my Twitch account. Uh, go ahead and send me a message on any of those and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible, but uh, please guys be patient because I do get a lot of messages, so if I don't respond to you right away within like a week or two, ju just be a little patient, I'll get to it as soon as I can. If you do decide to send in a story, uh, please be sure to include in the description of the email or message what the name of the story is, what the category of the story is, and how you would like to be credited in the video that the story appears in. Uh, if you guys are curious about the music used in this video, uh, links to the music and the order in which the music appears will always be in the description below the video, so you can go ahead and check that out there. Uh, last but not least, if you guys do enjoy my content, please uh, take a look at my Patreon, and if you feel so inclined, maybe donate like a dollar or something. Every little bit helps. Uh, it'll never be necessary, but of course, it's always an option if you guys would like to support the channel. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day.